fan. Welcome to your commercial free uninterrupted investment show sponsored by the sec registered investment firm wilsey asset management a fiduciary firm owned and operated by president brent wilsey who has been putting clients investment needs first for over 40 years the smart investing show has been giving unbiased financial information for over 27 years on local radio stations right here in san diego providing you with fundamental analysis on stocks and investments you want to know about now here are your hosts brent and chase wilsey well, good morning and welcome to the Smart Investing Show. I'm Brent Wilsey, just about 8.02 on Saturday morning. Great to have you here this Saturday morning and every Saturday morning talking about uh, the economy, finance, investing, how to build your net worth. And with, with me is Chase. Good morning, Chase. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. Doing well. We got a lot to talk about today, so I thought we'd uh, get right into it and talk about the jobs report that came out yesterday. Uh, report blew past the estimate of 150000 as non-farm payrolls grew 467,000 in January. Also, November and December saw a huge revision upward as it totaled 709,000. Uh, I was surprised by the uh, magnitude of the beat. I wasn't surprised to see a good report. We can't forget that employers are still desperate for workers as the job openings in December, which comes from the Jolts report, totaled nearly 11 million, which was 4.6 million above the total unemployment level a lot of extra jobs there yeah and it is again as i, I want to reemphasize that i mean it, it was surprising to see it but then also if you kind of think about it and oh uh, yeah i guess that makes sense yep. it, you know it wasn't anything that kind of caught me off guard but it's also important to remember that we are continuing to again regain jobs that were lost due to the covid lockdowns i mean I, again i got to reemphasize this too is We've never seen anything like this where the government came in and said, nope, sorry, you can't go to work today. <laughs> yeah, stay that home. That was such a unique <laughs> thing. And we're still currently, if you look at total unemployment, about 1.7 million jobs below where it was in February 2020. And, and I, I got to say, too, I still anticipate a strong job market this year as we continue to recoup those losses. Again, you look at 1.7 million, you still got some room to go in terms of regaining yeah. those jobs. <laughs> But it's in 2023, and I start to get a little more concerned with both the economy and the jobs market. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on uh, in the economy. There's a lot of money out there. Companies have money, uh, put them money in people's uh, pockets. But again, is this should keep going on through, and I think it's going to be volatile on the interest rates as the government sets those interest rates, or the Federal Reserve does, because you could get some confusing data. You get a lot of uh, a good jobs report. Oh. You know, rates going to go up because the economy's going to be strong, inflation, and so forth. I think we could get a bad jobs report maybe in the next few months or so. I don't know. I, n nothing to base that on other than life that sometimes things don't come in the way you expect, which uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. That That's what makes our job so interesting. You don't know what's going to happen going forward many times. Yeah, and it, it was interesting to see yesterday. I, I was surprised to see the NASDAQ climb because the 10-year the note, went over 1.9 percent Yeah, 1.94 i think it hit and, yeah. and I, I think it was just people trying to buy the dip on yeah. on big tech i, I think that's what kind of led to the nasdaq climbing i, I think perhaps next week we could see if the, the 10 year note stabilizes or perhaps hits that two percent level right yeah. very real possibility <clears throat> i'm not sure if cpi comes out next week or the following but if that comes in very strong you'll see the 10 year note climb quite substantially and i, I think again you'll see the the dip continue Right. Big tech. Right. And we, we did have reports from the big uh, tech companies. Uh, we're going to talk about two today. Well, one, let's uh, talk about Wall Street was excited by Amazon's earnings this morning. Actually, when it's at uh, Thursday morning, uh, the stock was up 15% in morning trading. Optimism came from the cloud, which saw revenue climb approximately 40% to $17.8 billion. Ad revenue, which climbed 32% to $9.7 billion. And earnings per share, which came in at $27.00. And 75 cents just blew past the estimate of three dollars and 54 cents it may be unpopular opinion but i was not that impressed by those numbers to start earnings per share is extremely misleading as the valuation gain on rivian accounted for get this number 11.8 billion of the total net income of 14.3 billion <laughs> yeah kind of strip that out you exclude the non-reoccurring events there because uh, i don't think they're going to have uh, Eleven point eight billion dollar gain uh, from Rivian next Q four. <laughs> so <laughs> right. uh, kind of important to kind of strip some of the, those earnings out and kind of look at the the non reoccurring, excluding those. 
uh, Amazon would have actually posted earnings per share of just $5.80. That, that still beat the estimate, but compare that to last year's EPS of $14.09. That's a huge decline. And, and people get, oh, they're an investment cycle. It seems like Amazon's always an investment cycle, yeah. which, you know, you can kind of make some arguments for it. But it's just something that, oh, well, when this happens, the earnings are just going to climb through the roof. We'll do $100 a share in earnings. Yeah, <laughs> right. it, it's it's something that I just haven't seen come to fruition just yet. And also, too, you look at the e-commerce business. It struggled immensely in the quarter as the U.S. business had an operating loss of $206 million and the international business had an operating loss of $1.63 billion. So, too, you talk a lot about sales with these big companies. Oh, well, it's not about the earnings. It's about the sales. Well, I was not impressed at all. Sales grew just 9.4% in Q4. And guidance, this is why I was shocked the stock was up substantially. Yeah. You also have to remember the day before it fell about 7 8% in trading. So it kind of recouped some of those gains. But guidance most of the time takes down these big tech companies. Guidance was extremely weak because the company is now looking for sales between $112 billion and $117 billion in Q1, which is just growth of 3 to 8% compared to the first quarter of 2021 and substantially below the estimate of about $121 billion. Operating income in Q1 also looks extremely weak as the company guided for 3 to $6 billion, which compares to $8.9 billion in the first quarter of 2021. I just got to say, overall, I, w- the impress- I was just unimpressed by this because the company trades at 42 times 2023 earnings per share. Hey, and I almost think it was kind of like a relief rally because you had Facebook come down so much. You had like PayPal and Tess. I mean, all these ones coming down, and then here comes an Amazon and it wasn't as bad as maybe they thought, even though, again, it is amazing the guidance was not as good, which usually, like there's companies that report good current earnings for the fourth quarter for the year, but then they guide like, oh, not so good, the stock will fall. Didn't happen with Amazon, but I think, isn't the all-time high for Amazon like 3,800 or something? So it's still not close to that yet, I think. It's, and you know. it's still negative on the one-year time frame. And it's still negative. Yeah, okay, I thought it was, I, yeah. I believe that is the case, but again, you, you look at some, some company trading at over 40 times future earnings. Y- you got to have better growth <laughs> than 3 to 8% on, on sales and, and can't have declining operating income. And I kind of saw this rally as a, a yeah, but rally. Right. And what I mean by that is like, yeah, sales weren't that great, but cloud was really, really good. <laughs> and, and I'm going to go back to Netflix. We saw this same exact thing with Netflix. Oh, well, it's not about earnings. It's about the subscriber growth. Right. All of a sudden, the subscriber growth falls apart. The stock gets <clears> dismantled. <throat> Same thing I think happens with Amazon. When you start to have that yeah, but type moment, now you're just looking at cloud. Now it doesn't really matter what's happening with sales earnings. If cloud has a big miss, the stock's going to get hammered right. because they're <clears> like, oh, so focused on that one singular event. And, and you got to ask yourself, like, you can kind of see they're trying to make excuses for this, trying to push forward. What upside potentials really left in this stock, especially with the rising interest rates, because that we know that's going to keep hurting them uh, with this report. Okay, fine. But uh, rates are not going to turn and go down. So it makes the, those high valuation stocks even harder. So they're really, a lot of these big tech companies have really got some major headwinds they're coming into and uh, surprising that they did well. Again, I think it was, as you said, just the, well, but this, but this. Uh, and I think kind of like a relief rally, like, oh, okay, it wasn't as bad as we thought. That's not how you buy growth companies because growth companies, you expect the growth to continue. And I think this year could be a deciding year for them that they're not s- worth those high valuation ratios. Yeah, and I, I, I was just kind of surprised watching some of the financial pundits on you know the different channels. It, Amazon's result, jaw-dropping. Sitting there, jaw-dropping? Yeah, I, I, didn't look at the details. I was looking at the numbers <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I mean, the earnings, again, crushed it, but you back out the Rivian, it, it just... I would not classify it as jaw dropping, and, and I, I will admit there are times where Amazon has had very strong earnings. Right. And it's like, well, I still wouldn't pay paid that price because it was again fifty times earnings, but they substantially surpassed this report. I said ah, I, I wouldn't call it jaw dropping. <laughs> I, I guess the only thing I'm saying that is that the earnings did come in at uh, five dollars and eighty cents. The estimate was three fifty four, and again that five eighty is backing out the Rivian gain there. But this reminds you a lot of the tech boom when like, oh, look at all the money they're making because they were selling off assets or doing other things and investing places. It wasn't coming from earnings from the business. It was coming from other factors that don't continue. And then all of a sudden it it looks real bad. So um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, again, everybody uses Amazon. It's a a great business, but is it worth, what do you say it was, 44 times 
about Ford earnings. That's just very, very high. More, more than twice as much as the average of around 14 to 17. That almost should, three times. Yeah, question. almost three times. Yeah, I try to be generous. <laughs> Let's talk about the other one. And I hate saying this, uh, Facebook Meta. I just hate that name, Meta. I know what it means, but I'm just so used <laughs> to saying Facebook. But uh, they lost over $200 billion of market cap uh, last week, or this past week, because earnings did not please growth investors. Shares were down more than 26% because the company earned $3.67 per share when the estimate was $3.83 a share. That's a large miss. And also, daily active users were $1.9 billion, only a 5% increase from a year ago and below the estimate of 1.95 billion users. It was also the first ever quarterly decline in daily active users for the company. I mean, this is uh, not very good. On top of all this, guidance going forward is disappointing for a growth company with revenue for the first quarter expected to be 27 to 29 billion. Well, with a growth rate of just three to 11% and below the estimate of 30.3 billion. Uh, the numbers just don't get very good here. Yeah, I mean, you look again at the valuation. This company has a forward price to earnings ratio of 22.6. If the growth continues to slide, the stock could have even more pullback this quarter and, and even this year, for a matter of fact. Uh, this drop in the stock wipes out the entire year of gains and then some. So, again, you're still talking now about Facebook and Amazon. They're, they're now about flat to down mm -hmm. for that one-year time frame. Yeah, and if you're thinking about stepping into buy shares of Meta, also know as Facebook, after the $230 billion drop market value uh, this past week, you may want to consider the following. Apple's new ad privacy policy is expected to cost about $10 billion dollars and lost sales for 2022. Uh, that is about 8% of total yearly revenue. Uh, this is one of the many headwinds that Facebook is facing going forward. You also got the government coming against these big tech companies. There is a lot of uh, headwinds for Facebook, uh, Amazon. Uh, Google did okay uh, last week as well. Um, but it's just kind of amazing uh, what these companies have to go through. Yeah, and it's uh, again, something that we've warned against for years, and, and we always tell people, again, we miss those upsides. Yep. You know, we're, we're not going to buy Facebook, and did we wish we bought Facebook, you know, years ago and then sold it before this past week? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's not how investing works. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we miss those upsides, but, you know, we want to avoid those kind of catastrophic type earnings reports that, that can really, really take down your portfolio. Right. And, uh, oh, by the way, we're going to open the phone lines, 833-288-0973. Uh, That's 833-288-0973. As always, get you through for your unbiased, no strings attached, fundamental opinion about what you want to talk about. But, Chase, uh, going back to the Facebook situation and, and, and so forth here, when we talk about a portfolio, this is one thing. We, we do miss the big high flyers. but. Somebody can get lucky and buy one or two, and I'm saying lucky because you, you do it like, well, yeah, I'm up, you know, a thousand percent. You said it wasn't good, but here I am up a thousand percent, which is far better than uh, had I done had I bought like a food company. Well, that is true, but you got to build your whole portfolio and put in there. You, you know, again, we do run a concentrated portfolio of 15 to 18 positions. You've got to know what you're doing because if you have a position or you know, 100 positions in your portfolio. And, uh, you know, the, the Facebook only made up a half percent or one percent. Well, our portfolio probably longer term did better than your portfolio because you may have the other money in cash and so forth. So uh, we can always talk about the equities we talk about here. But one thing we do talk about our workshop is the portfolio. You've got to have a good, solid portfolio. Just buying one or two good picks over, you know, four or five years and that's all you did. Your portfolio is not going to be that great. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I, I did want to kind of bring up the fact that, you know, you look at these high price companies, a lot of times they're priced for perfection. And I was trying to get the numbers for you on um, kind of what we looked at at Apple. But I, I want to kind of bring this up to investors. We still have some time uh, before we start taking calls. But if you look at a, a company like Apple, you know, the enthusiasm made temper going forward as the details of the numbers have come out showing that greater China revenue increased 21% to a record $25.8 billion during the quarter and accounts for approximately 21% of the $124 billion in sales. Now, we talk about this. After the Olympics, we could see more pressure from Russia on Ukraine and talks of military action. Remember, Russia and China have become friends over the years. 
Now, let's just think about this. The Biden administration has talked about economic sanctions on Russia if it attacks Ukraine. That leaves open the possibility that China could back Russia and could turn a cold shoulder to the United States hurting Apple sales. The estimated Apple earnings for the year 2023 currently stand at $6.20. Now, if China were to react, it could definitely hurt Apple's earnings for 2023. Let's just say they drop 10% to $5.58. Even with a very forgiving price to earnings multiple of 24, that would give us a target sell price of 133. This could cause more fear and could send the price to earnings multiple to 20. That would then bring the stock all the way down to $112 per share. I talk about Apple's a great company, but you got to be prepared for what could happen on the horizon. And, you know, things might not happen with China right. and Russia. And, and the whole idea why we, we did that post and put that out there is because you got to think about what's going on. Yeah, you have people, oh, Apple's a great company. Oh, they'll never follow and so forth. You have to understand what's going on. And by the way, I saw, I think it was yesterday, uh, f- footage on, on the news of um, the, the two leaders from China and Putin uh, walking together. Uh, what's his name? Zing? Uh, uh, Xi. 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 Uh, walking together, uh, talking about, no, NATO is not here. So they're agreeing on things. So you got to look at things. When you look at investing, and we had a, a potential client come in yesterday ask, well, do you just you just look at the numbers? you look at the whole thing? No, we're, we're looking at what else is going on. And you can't just blindly say Apple um, is going to be like never go down. It's going to be a great company going on forever. Nothing goes on forever. Remember the BlackBerry? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a bit, oh, nothing's going to stop BlackBerry. And again, Apple is a great company. They've got a great products, but there's things that can happen. And I think you said that the revenue they get from China was what twenty one percent. If that gets disrupted, that's huge. I mean, and I, I think we laid out some numbers for people to drop it down. I, I think just ten percent in the earnings, but it could be more than that. So it, it, it just these are things you have to look at. Um, I know those people have big positions in Apple, but uh, and I don't yeah, think uh, again anything's going to happen during the Olympics. I, oh, yeah. I, that would that would piss China off against Russia if they did something. So I think uh, what do Olympic, Olympics last two weeks? I don't know how long the Olympics. <laughs> I, I, I'm not even interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I did hear some some things about. Uh, I think it came from Nancy Pelosi telling the, the athletes. Be quiet. Don't say anything. You're in a foreign country, uh, which could also cause problems, too. Somebody says something and China doesn't like it. I mean, that's the world you're in. That's why we don't buy the high valuation companies, because of the fact that these things can happen and destroy them. And again, we saw Facebook drop, what, 20, 22 percent. Netflix dropped 20 percent. We get upset like, got it. You know, our company dropped three, four percent. That's usually what's going to happen with a value company versus a growth drop in 2022%. And it can take you a long time, many times, to get that 20, 22% back. Yeah, and, and this is, again, Apple's kind of one of those, yeah, but stocks, I'm going to say. But you, you got to look at the, the four PE right now, it's about 26. And, and there's just, there's not much growth in the stock. You look at the earnings growth, it's like 6%, 5%. I mean, they're not growing that much. And as you said, if all of a sudden you take, some issues, right. and you go to flat to declining growth rather than a small single-digit growth, whew, that's yeah. what can take it from 26 times earnings back down to 16 times earnings, and that's a huge fall. And I say 16 times because we held Apple in the past, and it took years for it to all of a sudden people said, oh, but the service revenue, right. and, and now <laughs> it trades at 26 times <clears throat> earnings. They've had the service cool. revenue for years, and it's been growing and growing and growing, but it, it, it's just something we don't like to wrap ourselves up into because the higher those valuations go, the more it's priced for perfection. And that perfect situation we know does not mm-hmm. pan out forever. And we also talk about what's called the dead zone. We call it the de- dead zone to where now it's not a, really a growth company. Growth investors don't like it, but yet it's not low enough to where value investors like it and can just stuck in that range because nobody really wants to buy it. Not a value company, not a growth company. And it can lang- languish there for, for sometimes years. Yeah. So, yeah. So, all right. Uh, let's go out to the phones here. Let's go out to or up to uh, Oceanside and speak with Carl. Carl, you're in the Smart Investor Brent Chase. How can we help you? Yes. Uh, yesterday, I <clears throat> went to the grocery and I looked at their meatless product. And they are about the same price as the real meat. I'm wonder, I, and I looked at the chart today, and uh, at one time, uh, their price was 200, and now about 58 Ooh, wow. at the IPO yeah. price again. Yeah. I'm wondering, do they make money? 
All right, well, well, let's. You know, it's funny you bring that because I've been kind of looking at the same thing. I have seen the price of that Beyond Meat change uh, trades at, and I was wondering the same thing. I mean, I, I, I think you did say at the grocery store that now the price of Beyond Meat and regular meat is about the same because I think before they had a big premium on the Beyond Meat. Uh, I, I, yeah, you know I was, was going to ask you, Carl, have, have you tried the Beyond Meat or you just kind of noticed it? I just looked at that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think beep, beep. People like the real thing. Yes, I, I think they do. And I, I've tried the Beyond Meat. And it's like, yeah, it's okay. But it's just like I still like the real meat. But uh, uh, this did have a big pump. So let, let's take a look to see if it now it's time to, beyond, to buy Beyond Meat. Uh, we do see that, wow, uh, shares short here, 38.8%. There's a lot of shorts on this company. That's not good. Uh, a lot of people think the stock's going to fall further from where it is. Institutional ownership, 609 no P.E. ratio, which means have no earnings over the last 12 months. Uh, the industry P.E. ratio is 23.5. Price to sales, very expensive, 7.9 versus 1.7. Price to book value, 17.9 versus not material. And then we do uh, not see any price to cash flow because they don't have cash flow apparently. And no peg ratio either uh, from the analyst. So uh, looking at their, their earnings per share, we see Gosh, no earnings per share growth. I guess they don't have earnings, so you can't grow it. Now, their sales uh, over the last uh, one year are up 14.5%. That is better than the industry at 7.8%. And I think I did say the industry is packaged foods. Uh, looking at uh, here, no dividend. They don't pay a dividend. Look at the balance sheet. Uh, they're very important with this company. Current ratio, wow, 15.5 versus 1.4. They've got a lot of liquidity, a lot of cash there <clears throat> to actually – uh, keep this company going forward. So that's a good thing when you have a growth company like this. We do see uh, their uh, day sales out, out outstanding, about 38.2, about the same as the industry, 39.3. Uh, we see a net profit margin, a negative 27.2 versus a positive 7.3. And this does worry me because I'm pretty sure before when these products came out that the prices were much higher than normal meat or regular meat. Uh, now you said they're about the same. That's probably going to hurt their profit margins going forward. They can't get the high prices that they want for uh, their their companies uh, for their products here. Uh, return on equity a negative sixty one percent versus a positive twenty two point nine. Uh, return on capital negative nine versus a uh, positive eleven. Just uh, not looking good here. And what I've got, Chase, you, you see some good things maybe going forward. Well, let's talk about the current price here first. Fifty eight dollars sixty eight cents. Fifty two week high. I mean, we know it's plummeted from that level. So it was one hundred eighty three dollars and seventy five cents. Uh, near its fifty two week low as well. Fifty three dollars and ten cents. See year to date down about ten percent. But over the last one year, you're down sixty five point three percent on that stock. So uh, not good numbers there. Uh, going forward, uh, unfortunately, still not estimated to make any money. They're still estimated to lose money in both December 2022 and December 2023, so I can't get a target sell price. And I've kind of heard speculation, oh, well, maybe it could be an acquisition target. Well, we have a food company in our portfolio, and we know that they're working on, I'm going to call it meatless or hybrid right. meat <coughs> products. Right. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering if they're kind of taking that approach, saying, no, we can do it in-house rather than buying like a Beyond Meat and if these numbers continue, I mean, they could kind of force them out. And you wouldn't want to buy a company because you'd have to pay a premium for Beyond Meat if you were to buy them. And then the earnings wouldn't be accretive clearly for years because they're not making any money. So if you buy a business, you want the earnings to all of a sudden and the cash flow to be accretive to your business. I wouldn't see how that would be uh, implemented in an acquisition. Or at least be accretive uh, it, it means positive earnings uh, over the next year or two. Uh, and just don't see the benefit of doing that because you're not buying customers. I mean, you, you are buying a brand, which is pretty well known, but obviously that brand is not doing that well. And the market cap, I think, is what, around $4 billion. You're right, you're not going to pay it at the current price. It might cost you five, six billion dollars. That's a long time to get that back. And if you're already have an established food name and you come out with meatless products, uh, people want to say, oh, yeah, we, we know Sanderson Farms. We know, uh, you Jimmy know, Dean. Jimmy Dean. We, we know those names who are comfortable with those. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I just would love to tell you that, oh, yeah, this is a great buy this level, being down, what was it, 65% for the one year, Carl. But uh, I, it's, it's just um, there's no meat behind it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Carl. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you for calling. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right, that does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 
288-0973. And I'm very curious. Our, our food <coughs> company reports this next week. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see how those meatless and hybrid meat products are doing. I, I mean, because perhaps if they come out and they're like, oh, it, it's growing tremendously, we're capturing market share, that's not going to be beneficial to a company like Beyond Meat. Right. And I do remember some of the hype stories behind this, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great and so forth. And it's like, uh, uh, again, another investment that has a lot of excitement behind it, but no fundamentals behind it. And we said, no, you, you know, it's just not there. I mean, things can change, but I still don't see everybody going to meatless products because there is, again, I'm not a dietitian, but there are positives to red meat that you can't get from vegetable products. and. And there's people that like red meat, so it's just, uh, you know, as as a like another vegetable maybe, okay, but it's not going to be like, oh, this is going to take over the world and no more meat products. And, and again, as you said, we're not dietitians, but I remember looking at the packaging of what's in there, and I, I remember hearing, if you don't recognize ingredients, right. you probably shouldn't <laughs> be eating it, and there's like so many <laughs> ingredients in that thing, and uh, and I like red meat, I like chicken, I like yeah. you know, pork, I like the other things, I'm like, I, I don't really like the idea of the plant-based meat yeah I, i've had them and again they, they taste okay i think uh my fiance we, we she gets uh um these sausages that are meatless and they, they taste pretty good but it's not beyond meat right it's or you know i don't know if it is or not yeah, okay. i just know it's not real meat it's kind of they're kind of say it's a competitor a competitor maybe yeah so uh but uh it, it, it's just something that again as investors go you you've got to be careful of things that they had uh, you know yeah great product uh this will probably be in my opinion like a gopro uh, GoPro hit a high of what, forty, fifty, sixty dollars a share. It was like eighty, years eighty, ago, perhaps. Yeah. It's way up there. It seems like it's been at eight dollars a share forever now. You may see this with Beyond Me. I, I think it could fall further. It's not going to go away, but you could see the stock price. And I'm just throwing out numbers. You could see that twenty, twenty-five dollars a share and stay there because the business will continue on. Uh, they get, as I said, a lot of cash there. Uh, to continue on, and their their debt. Uh, oh, their debt. I didn't. I didn't see the debt. The debt was a. Uh, 560% debt to equity versus a 90% for the, a 0.9 for the industry. And with the return on equity so negative, I wonder yeah. if their equity is extremely small. Yeah. I, I didn't pull up the debt to equity because the number is so high. It didn't look like it was debt to equity. <laughs> it was so bad. All right. Phone number is 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. We, we got a wireless caller here. There's, there's no name on there. Uh, um, so... I guess we'll we want to go to the unknown, like the unmasked, uh, the, uh, the masked singer. <laughs> Let's go to the unknown caller uh, in Oceanside. Oh, is that Ted in Oceanside? There it is. Okay, yeah. Ted, Ted. in Oceanside. Good yep. morning, guys. Good morning, Ted. How are you doing this morning? Hey, I'm doing well. I'm so glad I got to connect with you guys. So I have a, I have a couple of stocks that I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, purchasing some shares, and they, they in, they're incorporating what's called LIDAR technology, L-I-D-R technology, which is for autonomous uh, cars being totally autonomous with a certain type of radar technology that surrounds the car. The first one is called AVA, A-E-V-A Technologies. Uh, it's trading about $5.24 a share. And the second one is the same technology by a different company called A-E-Y-E Incorporated. But that's under lighter technology. And that's at two ninety a share. So they share the same technology. I know that one of the companies, I, th I think it's the second one, A-E-Y-E, -E, uh, has brought over some uh, uh, Apple employees from the from Apple company to help um, boost their uh, their profits or whatnot or just kind of the, the background of the company. And I wanted your opinion. Yeah, and, and, and these companies, and, and again, a couple there, so I just pulled out one. I pulled out the AVA Technologies. I think that's the bigger of the two. Um, uh, kind of talk yeah. about it. And we know these are growth areas, so we're probably not going to like it because my guess is I don't have any earnings, but we'll still go over and see what we got here for you. Coming again is uh, AVA Technologies, symbols AEVA. -A. Uh, no short on them at all, which is uh, good to see. But institutional ownership, very low, 35.8. Now, what does that mean? It means you've got a lot of individual investors that are perhaps gambling with this, going in and out and so forth. So the institutions haven't really caught on to give you that, we'll call it the foundation yet. Uh, they do not have any earnings over the last 12 months, no PE ratio versus the industry at 18.3. Price of sales over 100 versus 0.7. Price of tangible book value, pretty important for a newer company like this, uh, 2.3 below the industry at nine. So that's the only positive I see because they don't have any price of cash flow, no peg ratio. 
uh, no earnings, no sales growth over the past uh, year here. Uh, do not pay a dividend. Uh, let's see, on the balance sheet, uh, we got a, a current ratio, very high, 33.1 versus 2.6. And you do want to check the balance sheet to see how much cash you actually have because that's a, an enormous current ratio of 33, as I said, uh, way above where it should be. Good point here, debt to equity zero, so no debt. They can stay in the party for a long time before they're forced into bankruptcy. Uh, we do see a uh, net profit margin, wow, a negative 1,097%. Versus a positive 4.7. Again, we know they're kind of growing here. Return on equity, a negative 19.4 versus a positive 11. Uh, return on capital, a negative 18.2. So this is a growth company, really, in the very beginning stages. You're not going to get any good fundamentals on it. Uh, Chase, do you see anything good going forward? Well, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm, I'm guessing with this business, with uh, price to sales multiple over 100, mm -hmm. I'm guessing this is almost like a biotech that, isn't really FDA improved yet that is actually making sales. I, I wonder if this is similar where they have the technology, they're working on the technology, yep. they haven't really made any deals yet, which is why you see such a high current ratio and you have cash burn. So they keep it so high so they can kind of burn through it. I, I, as I said, I, I would anticipate maybe they don't even have any companies that they're contracted with yet, or they could have contracts but not producing on those contracts. It's just some weird numbers there. But let's look at the current prices here. I do see that current price is $5.24. 52-week high, wow, $18.91. And 52-week low, $4.37. Year-to-date return down 30.7%. Market cap is still over a billion dollars, so it's not a tiny company. But if I go out to December 2022, I see estimated earnings per share of a negative 39 cents. And then again in 2023, it's still a loss of 38 cents as well. So this one, again, you're, you're kind of hinging here on Ted that uh, the fact that hopefully they maybe get some big contracts, maybe they get acquired. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> this one is, is definitely very speculative as to what could happen. And it could be like a Beyond Meat in a couple of years where right. it just continues to, to kind of tank yeah. and is something I'd be very cautious of. Yeah, Ted, this is very uh, speculative because you are betting on the, the product that they, they hope to come out with it. They get the big contracts and so forth. You're kind of swinging for the fences here. You could, you know, strike out uh, or you could hit it big. I mean, this this stock is, what, $5 a share now. If they do big, get a big contract, we'll say with General Motors or Ford, like, wow, the stock could be at 50 but also, to it could go from five dollars to twenty dollars a share for years to come and never do anything beyond that and it's kind of like dead money so just understand that uh, again you are rolling the dice here on this one could be a big win but also uh, we don't do that at our firm because we hate to lose money and that's a big possibility here all righty yep all right thanks guys appreciate it all right ted have a good one bye-bye all right that does open the phone line 833-288-0973 that's 833- 288-0973. Let's go out to Poway and speak with Tony. Tony, you're in the Smart Investor Brent Chase. How can we help you out? Good morning, guys. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Well, uh, so the background of this is I was listening to you two or three months ago, and, and somebody called about Qualcomm, and, uh, and, and you guys were very positive about it, and uh, I think... I was lucky enough to buy it somewhere around 129. Oh, good! Wow. And 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 then they had a one-day jump. I, I remember it was like 25 percent, and it jumped up. And it's so choppy now, though. It's between 180 and 190. It's it's concerning to me. I should be selling half of it if long term it's still solid, or just ride it out. Well, uh, that's where the numbers come in because, again, you had a nice run there. Uh, we're going to take a look at the numbers to see if it has or is bumping up towards its target sell price because that is a big run from, I think you said, 129 to around 180. So that's where we'll go to the numbers, see what we got here. Coming again, it's Qualcomm, symbol is QCOM. Uh, not much float or not, not much uh, shares short on this, 1.3%. Uh, Surprised on the lower institutional ownership. I say lower, it's 75%. It's not really low, but it's not as high as I thought it would be. Uh, we do see that they have a P.E. ratio of 20.6. That is below the industry at 28. That's a good sign. Price to sales, 5.7 versus 6.2. Price to book value, 75, which is very high, but the industry is well over 100. Now, they do have cash flow, so price of cash flow is 21.8 versus 17.5. A very nice peg ratio, which is your price earnings divided by growth. 
uh, tells you not paying much for the growth of the company, the lower the number. Well, Qualcomm's 0 0.7 versus 5.2. So we're paying a good price for the growth of this company here. Now, their earnings over the past year were up 49.5%. That is better than the industry at 39.2. Sales are up 35%. Industry only up 3.8. Uh, we do see a five-year earnings per share growth rate of 25.6%, also above the industry at 214 they pay a decent dividend. It's a 1.5%, and they use 30% of their earnings to pay that out. Taking a peek at the uh, balance sheet here, we got a current ratio of 1.7. Uh, that's below the industry at 3.5, but I'm okay with a 1.7 uh, PE ratio. Or I'm sorry, current ratio. Uh, we do see debt to equity 140% versus 0.6. That is at my upper limit. I know Qualcomm's a great company. It's got some great things going on here, but I don't like to see a debt to equity much more than 140%. Uh, we do see day sales outstanding, 40.7 versus 51, means they're really moving their sales pretty good here. Net profit margin is 27.7 versus 22.8. Return equity, wow, 88.1 versus 26.9. And I will say that kind of worries me a little bit. It's like it's too high. Uh, I would spend a little more time kind of understanding how that is so high. Is their equity very low? Is the return very high? Something, when you see numbers that's so good, you want to check into it, make sure it's fine. And then we do see that return on invested capital is 38.9 versus 20.8. So my numbers look pretty good. What do yours look like, Chase? Yeah, well, first thing, I, I remember a few years ago, Qualcomm went on a massive stock buyback spree. And yeah. it appears to really have helped, I think, reduce the uh, amount of shares outstanding. But that, I believe, is why the debt to equity and the return on equity look so strange. I think they've reduced the equity substantially by buying back shares. One thing I'd be curious on here too, Tony, is – now it seems like they're not buying back as much. Their buyback yield is about 2%. But are they now maybe looking at paying off debt to kind of clean up that balance sheet? And if they are, I'd be more comfortable with that 140% debt to equity. But uh, kind of moving forward here, I do want to look at current price, $179.47. 52 week high, $193.58. And the 52 week low, well, that's $122.17. Now, if I go out to September 2023, they report on a fiscal year. I see estimated earnings per share of $12.49. What gives a target sell price of $207.33? So right that right there, that's teetering on, I'd say, a hold and a buy for us, but you already own it. So I, I wouldn't sell out of it completely as long as you understand more about that debt level. I was going to ask how much of your portfolio does it make up there, Tony? Uh, pretty good share. It's a pretty good share of what I have. And you it, guys are talking about the, the relationships and what's going on with Ukraine and China. Yep. That concerns me also. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I, when you say a pretty good percent, I mean, is that 10 percent, 15 percent? I mean, how, how much of your portfolio does that make up? About 10 percent. 10 percent? If it was in our portfolio, we probably still would not uh, be worried about it yet. Uh, but, yeah, China is a situation out there that, again, you just don't know. And if we just don't know, we want to be aware of it, but also we will come back to the numbers saying, you know what, this is a strong business. And again, I, I did want you to check the return on equity, you're way too high. Uh, but if you can't find anything wrong with it, I'd probably say I would still hold on to it, uh, even in spite of what could happen uh, with the Ukraine situation and Russia and China. I mean, the world is always a, a crazier place, sometimes I think more crazier than others. But Qualcomm you know, has a good uh, foundation here. It's only 10% of the portfolio. I definitely would not buy more of it, uh, but I kind of watch things on a regular basis here, and I, I would continue to hold it 10%. Yeah. yeah. So, all righty. I appreciate your opinion. Thank you both. Okay, Tony, have a good one. Bye-bye. All right, that does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Time to talk about financial planning. For that, we turn to Harrison Johnson, our CFP. Good morning, Harrison. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, guys. How can you hear me today? <laughs> I think we're doing fine today. <laughs> we cannot figure out. We talked in the office. I have no idea why last week was so jittery there, so broken up. But I think this day is good. So what are we talking about today? So um, what I wanted to talk about last week was inheriting non-qualified annuities, um, something that a lot of people don't fully Understand. So first I'll start off by saying if you inherit stock or a bond or real estate or a company or any type of capital asset, you get a step up in basis 
uh, when that owner dies. So that means if you sell the asset when you receive it, you don't have to pay any income taxes on it. That is true for everyone, spouses and non-spouses alike. In addition to that, if you decide to hold that asset for a while and it continues to grow, and then you do sell it in the future, that gain is taxed as a lower capital gain at, at their tax rate. So that's a benefit there. Um, on a separate kind of side note, life insurance, when you have a death benefit from life insurance, that death benefit is income tax-free to you. Um, however, when you look at an annuity, a non-qualified annuity, so that's annuity that's not held in an IRA, when you receive an annuity as an inheritance, technically the account balance is considered a death benefit, but you do not receive a step up in basis, and also that unrealized gain is taxed at ordinary income rates as opposed to capital gain rates, and that's true for spouses and beneficiaries. So um, the reason why this death benefit is taxable and a life insurance death benefit is not is because in order to get life insurance, you have to be medically underwritten, where with annuities you do not. So that's kind of a little technical caveat there. But again, annuity inheritances are fully taxable as, as ordinary income. Now, you have a couple different ways on how you can receive that. You can have it um, sent to you over life expectancy. You can take it as a lump sum. You can take it out over five years. But however you want to do it, whatever that unrealized gain is, it's going to be taxable at ordinary income rates. So, you know, on the show, we've talked about annuities in the past and generally how they don't perform as well because of higher fees and how they're credited and, and, and things like that. But it's also important to understand that they are not efficient from a tax perspective either when compared to um, a regular investment account or like a, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA account. And Harrison, it just seems like there's so many pitfalls you're going to get with annuities, trying to get out of them. You think they're pretty good. You get to the end. Oh, they're not as good as I thought they were. Uh, they, they are sold big commissions. I believe the average commission on an annuity that uh, salespeople makes about 7%. Uh, sometimes I've seen as high as 14%. But that they just don't seem to be as good as they are. And this is why it's so important to have an unbiased financial planner that's looking at their total financial plan, not trying to sell them a product uh, to make a big commission. Yeah, I, I mean, annuities seem to be sold, or people like to sell them because of commissions involved, and then the the way that they sell them is what comes with all these guarantees. You get guaranteed growth, you get guaranteed income, whatever, but and it, because of how the growth is structured and because of how the income is structured, it's just not an efficient place to have your money for a lot of reasons. So I don't sell annuities for a commission. I used to, so I understand how they were before I learn the error in my ways. I don't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but I understand how they work. And, you know, it, you might have an annuity or maybe you'll be receiving an annuity at some time in the future from an inheritance from you know, parents or grandparents or whatever. Well, you might want to take a look at that now and see if there's anything that you can do uh, before you inherit it to avoid any negative tax consequences. And Harrison, this is one thing people can call you on as well as part of the financial planning. They might have two, three annuities like, oh, my gosh, I don't understand how they're going to work. I didn't do as well on them. I, I don't understand this. I mean, this is a, another part of what you do in financial planning. So if people want to kind of get a good financial plan and really see if annuities are great for them, they can give you a call on that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to understand how this asset works. All right. Well, Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for calling in, and we'll talk to you on Monday. Thanks. We'll see you Monday. All right. Sounds good. Again, as uh, Harrison Johnson, our financial planner, he is a CFP. Uh, you want to have a consultation with him or a phone call with him, uh, you can give him a call at the office at 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. You can also visit our website, <clears throat> smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. You can also contact him there by email. So uh, give him a call and uh, or contact him there. Alrighty, uh, phone numbers here, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Let's go out to Coronado and speak with John. John, you're in the Smart Investor, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Yeah, hi, guys. Um, stock I'm looking at, I've, I've been accumulating it for uh, about the last six months, is UPS. Okay. 
Uh, so you're going to accumulate it, so you hold it here. And uh, let's take a look at UPS. Yeah. I, I know that we did see some news come out. I think it was like a week or so ago. They did really well on, on I think it was their earnings, so I was kind of curious to see where they stand. Coming again as United Parcel Service symbol is UPS. Uh, not much on the uh, uh, short side of uh, 1% uh, institutional ownership. Surprisingly low, and I thought it would be 70.3. Uh, we do see an, a nice P.E. ratio here, 15.3 versus 17.9. Price of sales, 2 versus 1.1. Price to book value, 24.2, about the same as the industry at 25. And then price of cash flow is 13.2 versus 12.7. And also a nice uh, peg ratio of 1.3 versus 3.8. Now, this is a pretty strange number. The earnings per share change over one year is 374%. Versus 118.9, I guess we're probably comparing to the COVID levels. Uh, that's why that number could be so strange. We do see that uh, sales uh, growth over the same period uh, up 11.6% for UPS, but not as good as the industry growth at 17%. We do see a five-year estimated growth of 14% for UPS versus 113 for the industry. They do pay a nice dividend, 2.7%, and they only use 55.5% of their earnings to pay that out. They have grown that dividend for 10 years. They've paid that for 10 years in a row. Uh, we do see that the current ratio, 1.5 versus 1.4. Debt equity on the high side, 210 versus 130. That's one thing that's always kind of bugged me on UPS. They've got a lot of debt. Uh, they've done a great job managing that, but I don't like high debt companies. We do see that they have a net profit margin at 6.8% versus 5%. Return on equity, very good, 536 versus 32.6 and return on investment capital, 19% above the industry at 17.1. Chase? Yeah, so current price here for UPS is $224.79. 52 week high, well, that's $233.72 and a low $156.59. Uh, done pretty well so far this year, up about 5%. Uh, so, so done quite strong. Going forward though, going out to December 2023, I do see estimated earnings per share here of $13.37. That would give us a target sell price of $221.94. So it, it looks like UPS right now is about fully valued, in my opinion here, just based off the long-term average for where future earnings normally trade. And I will say, I think they've done a better job navigating the labor crunch than FedEx. It really? seems like they've kind of been able to get through some things where FedEx has kind of had to cut off some routes and uh, kind of had to change their, their supply and the way the warehouses work a little bit more frequently. But that's one reason I like FedEx a little bit more. It's kind of got that discount there. I think it's something that can be resolved. It seems like UPS is clicking on all c cylinders right now, which is why it's about fairly valued. I don't think there's much opportunity left in UPS at, at these levels. Yeah, and I'm not sure, but I believe Federal Express is bigger with more employees, where UPS, I think, is not quite as big. So maybe, maybe I'm just guessing here why they don't have – I've not heard anything about a labor problem with UPS, which they have done a great job navigating that. But, but what was the target sell price you said again, Chase? You remember? So about 224. So the current price is like two. Or sorry, the current price is 224. The sell price is about 221. Yeah. So yeah. So John, I I, I know you're coming. I probably would stop and, and sell based on the numbers here. Uh, great business, but I think they, as Chase said, click on all cylinders, which uh, things could come up. And we like to buy companies when they're not doing so well and sell when they are doing well. And right now, UPS is doing well, so we think it's time to sell. So all right, John. Okay. Well, sounds good. I, you know, I wanted to let you know that um, most of us do own an annuity, and it's called Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> what a great deal! <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, we All we, right. we want to talk more about that. <laughs> Thanks for calling, John. <laughs> bye bye. All right, that does open up the phone line eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Yeah, and I did want to take just one moment to kind of promo my, my charity here. Um, we do have a free yoga event tomorrow. I don't know if many of our listeners are, are yoga goers, but uh, we do have a free yoga class from 11 to 12 tomorrow. And then also really cool, we're, we're doing at this uh, place called Jaybird Kombucha. It is uh, over in Mira Mesa, and uh, Jaybird there is donating a portion of sales from 12 to 3. So if you're not into yoga, come join us for a, a hard kombucha. So good stuff there. <laughs> Uh, kind of a newer place here in San Diego, um, but uh, you know, it sounds like a support. drink. Uh, hard kombucha. It is a drink. Oh, it is no, a drink. It's oh, an alcoholic okay. beverage. Oh, it is alcohol. So mm -hmm. wait, you have alcohol and you do yoga at the same time? Well, so you do yoga first, and then you enjoy a nice oh. beverage <laughs> after. So, um, yeah, hard kombucha has kind of been something that's been. 
kind of growing a little bit more in terms of popularity. I will say it's more kind of for the younger crowd. I was going to say know. first time heard of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you are interested, uh, you know, we'd really appreciate the support. Uh, the details are on the website, which is, again, fightersfightfoundation.com. Again, fighters fightfoundation.com. Yeah, probably pretty easy to find that way because the name of the uh, yoga studio, it's going to be the yoga studio. No, it's going to be at the Hard Kombucha place. A kombucha place. Okay. Yep. All right. So is that the name of it? Hard Kombucha? It's J-Bird. J J oh, like is it J-A-Y? Bird. Bird. Okay. And then where is about on Mary Mesa Boulevard? Uh, it's actually right off like, uh, gosh, that, that main road there. It, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's uh, Camino Santa Fe. That, that's oh, the yeah. Road. It's yep. kind of like right in the middle there, easy to find. And then, yeah, yeah, so. I, I was looking at the website, so if, right. uh, it's right there. The address is on the Camino Santa Fe. <laughs> and do you know how long the class is going to be for yoga? It's about an hour. Okay, I was going to say if it was two minutes, I would try it, but I'm not going to do it for an hour. <laughs> but but uh, Christina might be there. I'm sure a lot of people will be there. So uh, one more time again, where it is. Uh, again, it's at Jaybird Hard Kombucha in Mira Mesa. And uh, visit the website for more details, fightersfightfoundation.com. And if you're interested in doing the yoga, just send us a, a quick email. The email is listed on our website there as well. Sounds like fun. I'm, I, I might just show up. I won't do yoga, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go back to the phones here. Let's go out to San Diego and speak with Jairus. Jairus, you're on the Smart Invest Show. Brent Chase, how can we help you? Good morning, guys. Uh, doing great. Uh, appreciate uh, all your help. And before I forget, uh, if you watched uh, the PayPal YouTube uh, last night, appreciate the uh, info on that. That's oh, great. Cool. Uh, so uh, reporting here from China, from the Beijing Olympics. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Putin won. Uh, uh, the other guy won. Uh, U.S. not so good right now, but uh, hey, we got two weeks. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks for the update the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you say out there. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I heard Pelosi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, by the way, she's doing really good on her, her stocks. Uh, oh, yeah. She's doing good. <laughs> we're not going to go there. I was going to say, we're not going to uh, go there, Jarvis. Come on. <laughs> um, you guys... You, you took a look at Intel last, uh, my notes show me, about September. I wanted you to take another look. Uh, I've been looking at them this week, and I'm thinking it might be time to to go on board with them, but uh, appreciate you guys' direction. Hey, yeah, let's, let's uh, take a look at Intel. Their symbol is INTC. Uh, they're in the industry of semiconductors, probably one of the most, well, I don't want to say the most well-known in uh, semiconductor company, but, but very well-known. Uh, not a lot of short on this company, which uh, kind of surprised me based on their past uh, movement in their stock, but it's only 1.7%, about 65% uh, owned by institutional. Uh, we got a P.E. ratio here, very good, 9.9 .9 versus 28. Price of sales, 2.5 versus 6.2. Price of tangible book value, 3.2 versus 100, over 100 for the industry. And the price of cash flow, 6.6 .6 versus 17.5. Now, the peg ratio looks pretty good. It's 4.2 versus the industry at 5.2. Unfortunately, the problem with Intel, they seem to be kind of stuck through a phase here. I don't know what to call it, but over the last year, their earnings are down 1.6%. When the industry is up 39%, sales are only up 1.5%, industry up 38 They do pay a nice dividend of 3%, only use 28% of their earnings to pay that out. Uh, we do see a nice balance sheet here. Current ratio 2.1 versus 3.5. Debt to equity 40% below the industry at 60%. Uh, they've got a, a, a good day's sale, sales outstanding here of 43.6 versus 51.5. You want that lower. Net profit margin beats the industry. It's 25.1 versus 22.8. Return equity is 20.8. Very good, but the industry is better at 26.9. And then we turn on invested capital, 16.2 versus 20.8. Chase? Current price here for Intel, $48.01, 52-week high over $68.49. So you see the, you know, pretty substantial climb there from the high. 52-week low, though, $46.30. You see year-to-date down about 6.1%. Now, if I go forward, though, and look at estimated earnings for December 2023, <coughs> I, I say they stand at $3.73 would give us a target sell price of $61.92. So I, I like Intel at these levels, and it's kind of funny. We talked about Amazon at the beginning of the show, how they get credit for going through investment cycles. Right. That appears to be what Intel is doing right now. So they're trying to build these fabs or these fabrication facilities to actually make those chips. And, and 
I think it's going to be a great thing for Intel in the long term. I think it's going to be a great thing for them, and I think it's going to be a great thing for our country in the long term as well. Um, but they're just not getting the credit, and it is going to squeeze earnings a little bit, which is unfortunate in the short term. But long term, I, I, I like the uh, potential prospects for Intel. Yeah, I think if you invest in, in, in uh, Intel, uh, I think it'll be patient. I think it's going to take some time for them to get the love that they need. <clears throat> they are putting in over $40 billion of, of new factories and stuff, which will be built. But uh, if you invest into it, you can collect that nice dividend while you're waiting of, what I say, 3% or so. But you got to be yes. patient with it. So it's not going to move tomorrow, next week. I think it's going to be probably uh, next year, the year after. You'll see perhaps some big moves with Intel because they've got strong fundamentals. But for some reason, the street just likes the other companies better until they start having problems, I think, for those other chip companies. Uh, Intel may not move. And I, I'm a big believer in the CEO, <coughs> Pat Gesslinger. I, I think he really has uh, a good finger on what's going on. I mean, everybody else with the chip shortages was talking about how, oh, it's going to be, you know, six months. He's like, no, 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 it's going to be a few years till we get this resolved. <laughs> right. And it, it seems like his forecast appeared to be the, the most accurate. <laughs> I think he understands the chip industry. I think he's the, the guy that can turn around Intel. Yeah. And it, it came from what EMC or something? Uh, McAfee. McAfee. And he, it started at Intel. It came back to Intel. That's right. That's what it was. Yeah. All right, Jairus. Okay. Sounds good. It looks like they're kind of building a, a foundation, uh, building out in Arizona, and I think somewhere out in Ohio or something. So uh, they're probably just getting ready for when it's time to uh, for them to grow. Yep. I I agree with that. All righty. So much. Take care, guys. All right. Appreciate have a good one, Jairus. Good talk to you. Bye bye. All right, uh, let's go up to San Carlos and speak with Steve. Steve, you're on the Smart Vegetable Brent Chase. How can we help you? Hey, guys. Uh, love the show. I, I wake up uh, every Saturday, and my wife wonders why I'm so willing to take my son to the park. At, uh, <laughs> well, I hope she doesn't listen because now she knows the secret. <laughs> I guarantee you she's still in bed sleeping in, and that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, uh, I got the, uh, the bit from Harrison, which was perfect timing i actually just lost a family member but received my first inheritance ever um and it was it was in the form of stock that was sold right away so uh, my understanding is it's tax free which is great news this time of year um my question is it was like 20 grand i'm 38 years old i got a three-year-old um i just put it all into uh qqq you know investgo index fund and wondering if that's a safe play for right now uh it turned out to work out okay uh i've got it like around 340 so should i just keep it there until i decide what else to do or, or make um, a more urgent move with it uh, i mean the qqq is actually the nasdaq uh, i think it's the top 100 or something and i'm kind of worried about that because there's a lot of growth companies uh, in my opinion we're starting to see growth kind of deteriorate here uh, i'd be concerned on the qqq and i saw this before that nothing happens for months and years to come. I, I would rather see you, you're young, I forgot you said your age, I think around 30. I'd rather see you start to really start investing into a portfolio uh, that would really kind of build for you and understand more about how we do things. And what we would do is, you know, you're welcome to give the office a call. We can sit down and kind of give you more details on that because uh, this is so important because you've got many years to go. You want to start compounding that money. And I'm just uh, on the QQQ, just not thrilled with it because a lot of growth companies. You guys yeah, I would just say, too, be careful with the QQQ because, I mean, we've seen them kind of get hit the hardest so far this year. And I, I think that could really continue just because they are so tech heavy. And as the interest rates have been climbing, they've been falling. I was trying to pull it up real quick, but they are a market cap weighted index. So you're really concentrated in Apple. You're really concentrated in Tesla and Microsoft and those those tech companies that are in the QQQ Gosh, I, I want to say last year the top 10 occupied like 60% or something. It was something crazy. So yep. I just say be careful. Yep. There's a closing bell, Steve. We've got to go. But if you want to call the office, give us a call at 858-546-4306. 858-546-4306. Thanks for listening to the Smart Investing Show. It is for informational purpose only and should not be used as investment advice. If you'd like to discuss in more detail your investment needs, have other investment questions, again, feel free to call myself Brent Wilsey or Chase Wilsey at 858-546-4306. And visit our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. A lot of great information there. And for more daily educational information on investment tips, go to our Facebook page, Smart Investing with Brent Chase Wilsey. Have a great Saturday. We'll talk more next week right here on the Smart Investing Show. I did all that And may I say